Good evening. So what I'm going to discuss in these three days is primarily from this book, which is available in the library, 37 Bodhisattva Practices, and with the commentaries. And it's also available in English, the same book available in English. I'm saying this not to sell the books of the library, <laughs> But because you are interested, if you are interested, then that interest must be sustained by personal study. Otherwise, nothing will stay in the mind. So what I have decided to discuss this time is primarily reading from the book. And uh, I'm reading primarily from the section on the path of the great individual, Kiva right? So, I have distributed this text for you to read, both in Tibetan and English, so that I am not talking in the darkness. All right. So, when we talk about the path of the great individual, we are talking about the Bodhicitta. Bodhi chitta. Bodhi means enlightenment. Chitta is mind. So Changchu the same, loosely translated into mind to enlightenment. Changchu the same, mind to enlightenment. But the explanation of or the definition of this is when you when we talk about Bodhi chitta, <coughs> this is something. His Holiness talks about, this is something that comes in the Mahayana teaching so frequently. So once and for all you should settle this matter <laughs> by understanding the meaning of this word, bodhicitta. Literal meaning is bodhicit, bodhi, enlightenment, chit, mind, mind to enlightenment. Definition is, bodhicitta is mind wishing to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. That's the definition. If somebody asks you, can you explain bodhicitta, then you should say it is a mind wishing to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So let us just reflect on this a little bit. Mind wishing to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. A mind aspiring to become Buddha for what? Not just for oneself or one's own family, but for benefiting all sentient beings. So there cannot be a mind which is more beneficial, benevolent, important, sacred than this mind. A mind wishing to give some money to some people or even 1000 people, it's good. But that's not big enough. Right? So there, there can be different types of mind wishing to benefit others, but they are very limited. Here, when we talk about bodhicitta, you have a mind <coughs> wishing to become Buddha, to benefit not just Tibetans or Chinese or Americans alone, but all sentient beings. Imagine this mind. Now, which includes people you don't like, which includes enemy, which includes tigers, lions, snakes, all sentient beings. Imagine. So, we need to think about this very carefully. Is it easy to develop such a mind? When you talk about cultivating bodhicitta, you are talking about all sentient beings, which includes, as I said, your enemy. So, can, is it easy for you to include your enemy and in saying that may you be, may I be able to help you by becoming a Buddha? So, these things we need to sit down and think how much we can do or what, how much sense it is making. It's not just, just enough to read, but how much sense it is making, why this mind is important. 
if you read this beautiful composition by the late Kundu Lama, Kinori Lama, uh, Tempe Jelsin, I think his name. He wrote a text which is now translated into English also. I think the title is Vast as the Space or something. That is the title. So where he says, if you are unhappy, meditate on Bodhicitta. If you are happy, meditate on Bodhicitta. If you have a problem, meditate on Bodhicitta. If you are walking, meditate on Bodhicitta. If you are sick, meditate on Bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is really like a panacea that cures all illnesses. So this, this about this mind, we really need to spend a lot of time think about it and appreciate it. In today's world, people are totally focused about material accumulation, and we don't pay much attention to the the inner mind, especially the positive emotions, the good mind, like compassion, loving kindness, bodhicitta, even in the case of those people who do talk a little bit about it, but somebody who really sees the goodness of this mind, somebody who is able to appreciate, wow, this is really the mind, I must have it, this is the diamond, this is the gold, this is my friend, this is my teacher, wherever I go, this mind is important for me, whether I am dying or sick or whatever. That kind of conviction is not there. We do, we do talk a little bit about compassion, talk a little bit about bodhicitta, a little bit about kindness, but the conviction, as I'm saying, this conviction is not there because we are not spending enough time reflecting on the greatness of these minds. As I was saying, today we are all running and running. Everybody is running, everybody is busy. Even to meet somebody, you need appointment, right? Everybody is so busy. Busy for what? Not for cultivation of bodhicitta. Not for cultivation of loving kindness. Not for cultivation of compassion. But to get jangu, <laughs> jangu means dollar. <laughs> to get dollar, to, to get money, to get material things. Everybody says busy. Bus is too slow, car is too slow, aeroplane is also too slow. You know, we fly, you know, even that you, you have to run. Why, why, if I use a bad word, why the hell, why the hell are we so busy? Only in pursuit of getting material things. We live in a material world. The modern world is a material world. Not only seeking material, material things, but materialism. <clears throat> materialism means all problems can be solved by material collections. With this kind of attitude, with the invention of science and technology, we got this habit of following the life of materialism. Now through this way, if there is a guarantee that we get long-lasting peace and happiness, and in fact, already now, or over two or three hundred years have passed since science came into the scene. So by now, we should have at least got some sense that yes, we are getting that stability, we are getting that reliable peace and happiness from material collections. If that is there, fine, then okay. Go for material accumulation. But the truth of the matter is, there is no sign. There is no sign that we are going to get that reliable, long-lasting peace and happiness. There is no sign, however much you run, there is no sign that you are going to get that long-lasting peace and happiness. You see. So therefore, when we engage in such kind of practice or Thereby, whatever kind of life you want to live, you need to ask this question. Or in, in fact, you need to develop this recognition that I want peace, I want happiness, right? And I repeatedly say this during all my talks, do you want happiness, do you want peace? Everybody says, yes, sir. Then I ask a second question, for how many days do you want peace and happiness? Then normally people smile, they laugh. And by laughing, by smiling, they are saying, Geshe-la, 
when it comes to having peace and happiness, it's not a question of few days. Because we want long lasting peace and happiness as long as possible. Now this wish to get the long lasting peace and happiness is not something, at least according to my understanding, it's not something that you learn from Buddhism or any religion. It's not something that your parents taught you. It's the way you are born. It's your inner call. So therefore it is really, really important to listen to this <coughs> inner call. I sometimes say that this is a slogan by which you came into this world, you know. The first thing that the child does after birth is crying. That crying is a slogan. So with that slogan of crying, he is basically saying, doesn't matter, he doesn't have a developed language, but by that crying, with that slogan <coughs> of crying, he say, I want happiness, peace. With that slogan, we came into this world. So that is not only your slogan, not only your inner call, but that, that is actually a good news. With the fact that, that you came into this world asking for long-lasting peace and happiness is a good news because that shows that you have the capacity to get that long-lasting peace and happiness. Provided if you listen to this inner call <coughs> and cultivate the positive emotions, strengthen the positive emotions, silence, weaken, reduce the <coughs> negative emotions. It is possible. But the problem, again, unfortunate thing, the problem is we have this habit of going only after the material, physical object, something that you can see, something that you can touch, something that you can feel, <coughs> and not, not so much to the inner call, because mind is something that you can't directly see and observe, you know. So, we, we don't do that kind of listening to the inner call, or meditation, or whatever you want to call it. So this mind is neglected. The needs of the mind is neglected. The need of the body is as much as possible that we are trying to fulfill the need of the body. We do physical exercise, we do jogging, and then so many physical treatments, right? But what kind of treatment are we giving to the mind? What kind of food that you are giving to the mind? The food for the mind is spirituality. Not necessarily religion, but spirituality. So much of the problem that we see today in the world is a clear indication that you have not given food to your mind. Your mind is starving. Your mind is starving. And as a result, you know, you, you know what a starving person will do. You see? So there's the indication. So therefore, at least to me, I'm not saying I'm a great practitioner or anything like that, but because of my study and reflection, it's becoming more and more clear that the solution of the problems that we, we are facing today in the world, the solution will not come from <coughs> science. The solution will also not come from religion, my understanding, my personal reflection, reflection understanding. The solution is to come from the man himself. The man who uses science, the man who uses religion. If the man who is the doer of the good things and bad things, if the man is set right, corrected, his attitude is changed towards what is realistic, what is in accordance with the law of nature, then everything will be fine. Solution lies there. <coughs> so if the man himself or herself the mental attitude of that person is left untouched, is left untouched, then, then it is not possible for us to bring about that change, solution for our problems, right? So therefore I think it's really, really important to listen to some of these teachings like on bodhicitta, on compassion, on loving kindness and so forth. So therefore, I have chosen this text. This text you should read. When I became director, then one of the first things that I commissioned to do was publish this book. Because this book is uh, not only a commentary on this 37 Bodhisattva practices, 
the writer of this book, 37 Bodhisattva Practices, which Thome Sangho is said to be, at that, his time, he's said to be a well-known Bodhisattva, having great healing power, whoever he touches or things like that. Very well-known, great teacher. And then the commentary written to these 37 Bodhisattva Practices by Zadul Rinpoche has written, you know, the commentary in such a way that he has quotations and exceptions from all the great teachers of all the Tibetan Buddhist schools. It's not just one school, you know. So therefore I commissioned this to publish one of the first book that we published after I became director. And then later on I also urged Julia to, to translate it into English. So the English translation is also available now. So we are in that way we are fortunate to have access to these texts, right? So therefore it is really not so much, you know, of importance to just speed through so many things. What we make, I want to adopt this style, the style that you know, you should know something, I should know something. Let us sit together, discuss something, so that we know at least what is bodhicitta. So tell me what is bodhicitta? A mind wishing to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. That is temperature of Buddha. The Mount Sepulchre of the If you know one thing, many other things will become very easy. If you don't know one thing, then go to the next, another problem. Go to the next, another problem. Then nothing will be there. So Bodhicitta is mind wishing to become Buddha. Speak louder. <laughs> a mind wishing to become Buddha for the benefit of. So remember this. Sanji Thamji Ji Thundu, Sanji Ji Koma Thomna, Nyambe Logic. The problem of Buddha. Sanji Thamji Ji Thundu, Sanji Ji Koma Thomna, Nyambe Logic. So you seem serious. Very precious. So, so we, have, we always recite this during many of our candlelight, you know, you know, demonstrations and things like that. May this precious bodhicitta which I have not cultivated be cultivated if you have not cultivated. And if you have cultivated, ensure that it does not degenerate. I mean, the good thing with this, again, I'm not saying I have great experience, but, but I, I sense a little bit, you know. The good thing is, the more, you, and he's always says this very powerfully, he says, when, as and when you develop these minds like bodhicitta, loving kindness, compassion, you know, you will feel you are completely now liberated from a bondage. You see? I mean, it's so powerful. He's always once said this. And what is the bondage? The bondage is your narrow-mindedness. Self-cherishing attitude, which thinks I, me, mine all the time. That's the bondage. Completely lost, engrossed, got stuck with small things, you know, my I, me and mine. And it's not only in Buddhism, but scientifically now it is proved that those people who make a lot of self-references, I, me and mine all the time, they are prone to all kinds of illnesses, including heart attack. Scientifically proved now. <coughs> so therefore, if you expand your perspective a little bit, think about all other sentient beings, or at least all human beings. There is a huge reason there. Why, why should I think only about myself? Why should I think only about myself? Like, why should I talk about only myself? Why can't I think at least to start with a little bit about others, you know, what is their need, how can I help them? A little bit smile, you know, to lighten their day. You see. Easily we can do. But we remain uptight, you know, proud, arrogant, stupid, ignorant, selfish, <clears throat> thinking only about oneself, my country, my society, my family. I mean, only talking about that. Of course you can talk about yourself, your family, but only thinking about that. And then fighting, neighbors fighting each other, 
religious organizations fighting each other, countries fighting each other, shows our narrow-mindedness. And Shanti Deva, he says, you don't have to kill people, they will die. <laughs> That's called wisdom. And that kind of wisdom comes by thinking a little bit <coughs> broader way, by reading precious books like this. Really. And as I was saying that we are prison of our own creation. It's not the external prison where you are, you know, imprisoned, but you are imprisoned through your own short-sighted, stupid way of thinking, only myself. When you think only about yourself, then you easily get sick. Because your, your, your focus is very small. And when you see all this, within this only small focus, even if there is a tiny problem like a headache, then you start complaining. I am the most unfortunate person. Other people are laughing and playing. See, I am getting this headache, you know. I don't believe in a God. If there is a greater God, he should, should not have created this headache. I don't believe in Buddha. If he is compassionate, he should remove my headache. But still I have this headache. You adopt 100,000 negative ways of thinking and imprison yourself, kill yourself, suffocate yourself. You, see. you don't do those things which can cure that headache by going to hospital, taking rest, taking good food. All those things that you can do, you don't do. Just sit there complaining. That's why we frequently get sick. Many people get sick unnecessarily because of their wrong ways of thinking, wrong ways of life. You see. So when you at least appreciate this positive minds or emotions like bodhicitta, loving kindness, compassion, you feel as he always says, you feel even if you're able to do a little bit somebody, you know, stranger or a friend, somebody. You feel that happiness is, I did something, you know. I helped somebody and he left smiling and happy, she left smiling and happy. What a great relief, you see. And we can all do this. And you will realize this, the more you grow older and older. I'm, I'm not so much because of Buddhist study probably, but as you grow older, you will start seeing the benefit of helping others. <coughs> so that's what we are talking about, bodhicitta. It's just like a rich family having one servant and that servant is very efficient servant. He does all the work of the house. So bodhicitta is like that. If you have just one quality, bodhicitta, he'll do all the job. Imagine, he'll do the job. Basically saying that if you have this wonderful and in fact the <coughs> best of all the minds, if you have this, everything will be fine. Now you need to think a little bit about that. How every, everything will be fine if you have this mind. As I indicated, everything will be a problem if you have self-cherishing attitude, which is opposite to bodhicitta. Self-cherishing attitude means thinking just about oneself, completely ignoring others. If you have that one negative emotion, it creates all kinds of problems. And that kind of self-cherishing attitude is called chronic <coughs> chronic illness and we are suffering from that chronic illness thinking just about one thing forgetting about others you see so replace this slowly slowly thinking a little bit more about others you see and that is source of flourishment that is source of harmony that is source of peace i mean if you look at the nature it's not just buddhism talking about it. if you look at the nature Nature will survive and flourish only when things are in harmony. I'm not talking just about human beings. Even with the plants and trees, when things are in harmony, the four elements are in harmony, when there is enough water, when there is enough heat, when there is enough soil, all those needed things are there. You know, they're in harmony, in balance. Tree will flourish. Flowers will bloom, you see. This law of nature. So similarly, in our case also, if your mind is balance with your body. Your body is balanced with the mind. And the four, four or five elements of your body, they are balanced because of your good style of eating food or sleeping at the proper time. If all this is done, you will flourish. You will blossom. So it is in your hand. 
It is in your hand. It is achievable. You to, for, for the time being, don't talk about enlightenment, you know, <coughs> nirvana. But even if you don't talk about many of the good things that you can achieve in this life, it's primarily in your hand. But we don't realize this. We don't realize this. We always think that somebody, someone else will do everything for you. Therefore, the Buddha said, self is the master of the self, self is the protector of the self, no one else can be the protector. Self is the enemy of the self. Now look at this. Self is the enemy of the self, no one else can be enemy. And you might think, oh, what does that mean, you know? I'm not enemy to myself, that's what you think, but the way you live your life, the way you think, the way you do things, Many of these things you are creating problem you, you, to yourself. An enemy is somebody who creates problem. And you are doing this. <coughs> you see? So therefore Buddhism is nothing but transformation of your mind from negative to the positive. Buddhism does not believe in a creator God. Buddhism believes in the capacity of the individual person. That you are the one who will make your destiny and you are also the one who will marry your destiny. A Tibetan Lama said, there is nobody who will catch hold of your hand and throw you into heaven, however good they are. Similarly, there is nobody, even your sworn enemy, who will catch hold of your leg and drag you into hell. He cannot do that. Your happiness and your suffering is in your hand, therefore do not cheat yourself. See, look at this. Therefore do not cheat yourself. By not doing the right thing, by continuously doing the wrong thing, we, we cheat ourselves all the time. <coughs> therefore we become sick, therefore we experience failure and so forth. Right? So therefore, at the outset, you should, first of all, be happy that we are able to discuss this precious word, Bodhicitta. Not many people have that. Not because I am teaching, you know including myself, all of us are lucky to spend this time thinking about bodhicitta. It's, it's once in a time opportunity to think about such precious mind. You know. How many, like six, seven billion human beings? What are they doing right now? You see, not many who will think about such precious practices. So we are lucky. You are lucky to have this interest, to have this inclination. You are lucky. Otherwise you will be doing something else stupid, you know, not very meaningful. And right now, like when you come for such teachings, not necessarily very, you know, encouraging or uh, very excited, but if you do stupid things, you know, going, ah, we're sitting in a, Shop, it takes sipping tea and then gossiping about everybody. It looks fun, you know, it looks good, it looks attractive. It's easy to do. That's why everybody runs and does those things, but not those things, you see, these kind of things. But very soon you will realize how important this moment is, how important these precious teachings are. Because at the end of the day, unless you help yourself, no one else can help you. And the more and more I see life, the more and I'm, I'm convinced that this is the truth. Even your so-called relatives, friends, however good they may be, but they cannot think for you. They cannot bring that long-lasting peace and happiness for you. You have to do it. Parents die, husband die, brothers die, sisters die, you see. What will you do then? Everything is in a flux, everything is changing. So therefore what, what we are talking about is really finding happiness in an uncertain world. If you use the word, instead of impermanence, if you use the word uncertain. And Buddha was right. He, he constantly, right from the beginning, the first talk that he gave was on impermanence. So he was, he was basically saying, finding happiness in an uncertain world. Your whole body is changing within few, like 24 hours or something like that. Everything, your cell, cells, you know, you know. 
Everything is atoms and everything is changing. Everything is in a flux. Yes. Relationships, everything is changing. So one that is in a way unchanging is that long-lasting peace and happiness which you can achieve. You call it enlightenment, you call it nirvana. Once you achieve this, then there is no falling back. The ordinary pleasures and happiness that we are experiencing today the Buddhist teachings say that how many times we have experienced this kind of pleasures and happinesses? How many times we have experienced this in how many lives? But where are we today? The same situation. Same situation. In Shanti Deva in his Bodhicharya gives a long discourse and then he summarizes by saying that So he summarizes by saying, if you're still unable to see the difference between bodhicitta and the self-cherishing attitude, then you should, he says, compare yourself to the Buddha. Buddha for countless lives practice bodhicitta, so where is he today? We may not be able to see him directly, but his teachings, still benefiting millions of people. That is Buddha. Now today we say the Buddhist population is around 500 million. In addition to this 500 million followers of the Buddha, there are countless others who are receiving inspiration from the Buddha's teaching. That, that is Buddha. Whether, whether he is physically there or not, you are able to see or not, these are different questions, but his teaching is still alive. And benefiting millions of people because he practiced, he taught, he meditated on bodhicitta. Now in the case of us ordinary individual, for countless, countless lives we, we discuss about self-cherishing attitude. <laughs> we meditated on self-cherishing attitude. So where we are now, still unable to take care of oneself, forget about taking care of others. That is the difference. And this, is, this point is especially important in the case of human beings. Because we got this big head with big brain, the capacity to plan, the capacity to judge <coughs> between what is right, what is wrong, which animals don't have. It. But this human intelligence itself is just a given potential. It's like the nuclear energy, neither positive nor negative. Whether this will become positive or negative depends upon where or which direction you will train your mind. If you train your mind in the positive direction, practice the positive practices, you will become Buddha. <coughs> you will become the Dalai Lama. You will become Mother Teresa, whatever. <coughs> but, if you use it in the wrong direction, then <coughs> Mao Zedong, Hitler, there's a long list there also. Same person, same human body, same capacity. There is one who with his life brings happiness to hundreds, millions of people. Others, just by hearing the name, people tremble. What unfortunate thing their life is, you know. <coughs> so therefore, It's really, really important to, to appreciate this great quality of Bodhicitta and make a commitment that I will try my best to be of some help, some benefit to other people or other sentient beings. And at the minimum, I should not become a source of unhappiness, trouble for others. And this, this process of thinking of the mind is really like, you try, I'm, I'm talking, you try. I also try sometimes, you know. And sometimes if some irritations are coming, some problems are coming, then, then I immediately say, oh, some problem, but don't see it as a problem, don't see it as irritation, just face that, talk about that, don't rush, don't get tensed. I advise myself, completely things change, you know. It's not something like unique to the monks or Buddhist practices, it's, everybody can have that feeling, you see. 
So you can, you can make, your, make your day very happy by thinking about these positive things. Your face will shine out. And I need to talk about all this now, you see. In one of the Buddha Sutra, he says, if you develop loving kindness, compassion and so forth, you, you, are, you are free from tension. You are free from blood pressure. Meaning that all your energies will proper, properly. When your energy, the wind energy flows properly, the blood circulation also takes properly. And then your face also gets blood. And then your face becomes radiant. It is there in the Buddha's teaching. I'm not making it up, you see. It's not just you're, you're tense and angry and have hatred and then outside you put some lipstick, cosmetics. And through inner transformation, if you make yourself beauty, it doesn't cost you anything. No thieves can steal it, no robots can rob it. But if you without this <coughs> inner peace, if you just decorate yourself even with the gold rings, then you are actually inviting thieves and robbers, you know. <laughs> That's the truth. That's really the truth. Like, I take the example of the Tibetans. When Chinese invaded, Tibetans had to just escape. To just save their life, forget about the precious things that they have. They hardly anybody has able to bring much, you see. But one thing that they saved after reaching into exile is the Buddhist culture. Which only not only saved the Tibetan people, but also become an inspiration for the rest of the world. Look, we are refugees, we have nothing materially, but still we are able to bring peace in the mind of so many people all over the world. Even small person like me. I'm able to give these talks, not only here in different parts of the world, many people get benefit, you see, that is the wisdom. If you have the mental wisdom, mental calmness, mental love, mental compassion, wherever you go, you are happy. It's really like going with a very good friend, a reliable friend. A friend doesn't cheat. Loving kindness doesn't cheat, compassion doesn't cheat, bodhicitta doesn't cheat, you know. These are source of inspiration. What is that a friend? Even, if the, even in the case of a good friend, you cannot travel with this person all the time. Even your parents, you cannot be with them all the time, you see. So the one that really helps you is education, knowledge. Especially the education of the heart, the positive thinking. Education is not equal to literacy. The problem is today, literacy is quite high today. But your education, questionable. Real education, questionable. Literacy is there, people can read, people can write, people can be quite eloquent, you see. But real education, especially of the heart, is not there. So therefore we need to talk especially about these qualities of developing the heart. So that's why I, I decided to read this text. So the, no, the first verse is number 10, which is not for this particular teaching, but this is number 10 in the text, so I just put it like that. The mothers who have been kind to me since beginning last time, if they suffer, then what is the use of my happiness? So, <coughs> so in order to liberate infinite sentient beings, generating bodhicitta is pra practice of bodhicitta. So in this text, it first discusses about the path to the small individual, then path to the middling individual, where you try to aspire you know, liberation just for yourself. So after this it says, okay, you aspire nirvana, liberation just for yourself, and you might be able to achieve that liberation. But even that liberation just for yourself is not enough. It is one-sided. So therefore he says, the mothers, means sentient beings, who have been kind to you or to me, beginning last time, irrespective of your able to know all of them or not, but because of so many lives that we have taken birth, all the sentient beings in one way or the other have been your mother or your father or your brother, your sister, have been very kind to you. So because of this, if you just be happy with your own personal liberation and forget about this rest of <coughs> mother sentient beings, then you are ungrateful. <coughs> you are ungrateful. It's just like somebody who gets a very good job and then immediately forgets all his family members. Some people do that, you see. Very ungrateful. And even in this, this particular life, whether you know them or not, but the, all the things, facilities, all the things that we are enjoying comes through the hand of so many people. 
in Africa, in Brazil, in America, in China, you know. The world is so closely connected today. We are so heavily dependent upon each other. So, so the mothers have been kind to me since beginningless time. Now even if you, you know, look at these people who you meet in Maglord Ganja, ordinary people, I've been to many, many places, many countries. Ordinary people, they are basically very kind-hearted. They are ready to offer you something to eat, they are ready to offer you something to drink, you know. They are very, very kind actually, you see. So it's because of this kindness of the ordinary people that we are surviving, not, not because of some leaders. I'm a little bit tired of some of these leaders in the world today, you see. It's ordinary people who, who are really, for me, they are the hope. And his holiness repeatedly says the country belongs to the people, not to the leaders. You see, so ordinary people, majority of them are really very kind. You see, and that's why we are able to survive. You see, so since they've been so kind, not only one time, but from beginningless time. Now, while today they suffer, if they suffer, then what is the use of my happiness? That means. If you have one, say, one mother who is very, has been very, very kind to you, now today if she is suffering, can you just completely forget her suffering and then sing and dance and enjoy and go for a picnic, things like that? No. Right? So you naturally will not be able to enjoy that happiness when your mother is suffering. Exactly like that. Exactly like that. Now, as far as the question of suffering is concerned, who is there who is not suffering? Tell me. So here again, we, it's, it's a question of understanding the depth of suffering. There are so many types of suffering which is explained in Buddhism. The suffering we know are the obvious sufferings, the manifest suffering, especially <coughs> the physical sufferings and so forth. But there are subtle, subtler sufferings which we even don't know. So the more you understand the depth of these sufferings, then the more you will be able to see, yes, <coughs> no matter how much they pretend, but everybody has this suffering, that suffering, you see. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama says that sometimes when we see some very old beggar or poor people, then we develop some kind of compassion, some kind of pityness, pity feeling. We give some money, things like that. But when we see somebody like a celebrity, a Hollywood actor, actress, Bollywood actor, actress, or president, <coughs> prime minister, there is no sign of compassion. <coughs> Instead, we'll, we'll, you know, you know, look at them with mouth wide open. Uh, how nice if they are my friend, or at least if I'm, get, I'm able to get their autograph, <laughs> their signature. Or oh, I got the signature of Michael Jackson, you know. <laughs> And he always says, actually, this, this so-called celebrities and leaders, actually, they are more ignorant than many of ordinary people. Because of their, this little fame and the little praises that is surrounded them, they, they don't, 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 don't think they are going to die. And they are more proud, well, not necessarily everybody, but generally speaking. They are more proud, more, more arrogant, you know, more exploitative, things like that. Right now, you see in the movie, in the television, it's going about this American man, I forgot his name, who during his time of glory, he has, he has mistreated many women, including rapping and things like that. Now, this is the talk right now going on in the television, you see. So that's the thing, you see. So ordinary people, they are already suffering and they have some understanding of their suffering because they are already fallen, therefore they, there is less jealousy, less, you know, negative sense of competition, things like that. So therefore, if you really are somebody who has this in-depth understanding of suffering, then whoever you see, as the seventh Dalai Lama in his beautiful composition, he says, Tomei Kyajun Pomo Sudala Tejang Chaluk Namjur Puruk Chejum Samato Dugi Misijewa Nyam Nyam Tundube Kenyam Trojin Namjur Nam Sudi Jova. Seventh Dalai Lama, he says, 
to, who, to whomever you see, the higher ones, the lower ones, the lay people, the monastics, to whomever you look, the only difference that you see is their costumes, their, their, their manner, their expression, their haughtiness. Apart from this, underneath, they are all same in suffering. They are all same. They are Chalu mam yur photo chejung sa mato. Dugi misi kewa. Their the whole life is experiencing suffering. In that level, they are all same. So therefore, it says, alas, the sameness of the fate of all these people. Then you feel concerned to all of this, these people. You see. So therefore, in all these things, we need to have a in-depth understanding of human life, life of all sentient beings. I mean, like, look at your body, you know. Outside it is plastered, you know, and especially if you're young, it looks okay. But just have a peep inside, or reflect a little bit inside, what is there? How these organs are functioning, how fragile they are, unless you be careful about what you eat. Even there, we are not very good. We just, just think everything is fine. Just throw everything into the mouth. Sour, sweet, hot, bitter, whatever, you know. Because we don't have the knowledge. If you have the knowledge how your lungs are functioning, how your kidneys are functioning, you know, you will be very careful. And therefore, Nagarjuna says, the fact that we are able to go to bed and sleep and being able to wake up this, the next morning is a magic, a mystery. Because the distance between life and death is just this breath. If you breathe out, cannot breathe in, that is called death. It's not a country where you travel and go, you know, things like that. Spending a lot of money, not like that. So once you see this fragility, that this <coughs> impermanence with your life, with the life of other people, where is the room for mistreatment, mistreatment of others? And I give this example, let us imagine the example of a very old woman here, say 95 years old. Number one, she is very old in terms of her age, 95 years old. And then moreover, she is suffering from a very terrible, you know, chronic diseases. There are wounds all over her body and passes are oozing out, you know. If there's a woman like this here, can any one of us will think about exploiting this woman? No. Because you know, you, you, you already know very clearly know the pathetic situation of this woman. Can anybody of us think about raping that woman? Ludicrous, no. Why? Because you know the situation. Similarly, other people, if you know the situation, how vulnerable, how fragile these people are, the wish to mistreat them, the wish to take, the wish to take advantage of them will naturally cease. I'm not saying easy. Because we are so habituated with the negative emotions. The impulse is strong, the negative emotions are strong. Despite our wanting to do many good things, we are unable to do that. We fail because of our strong habituation with positive, negative emotions and very weak habituation with positive emotions. But what I'm saying is, if, if you think in this way, reflect in this way, then they, this will you know, help you gradually understand the situation, develop more love, more compassion, more sense of responsibility to others. Right? So in order to cultivate this bodhicitta, first you need to cultivate compassion. Compassion is the root. Sometimes we call it like sense of responsibility, thaksam or nyingji. Now compassion, the definition of compassion is, it is a mind which thinks how nice if all sentient beings are without suffering. Definition of compassion is, it is a mind which thinks how nice if all sentient beings are without suffering. How nice if all sentient beings are without suffering. Clear? How nice if all sentient beings are without suffering. 
Now that kind of compassion is also developed by seeing the impermanent nature of all sentient beings. By seeing the lack of intrinsic reality of all sentient beings. The more you are able to see the fragility, the vulnerability of everybody, the more you are able to develop that concern. Like again take the example of these old women. There is more likelihood that all of us will develop some sense of concern, some sense of sympathy, some you know, sense of wishing to do something, that will come there. Because you are able to see that situation clearly. <coughs> right? Isn't this a good, good example? When you are able to see the true reality of that thing, then you are able to develop more of the positive emotions, less of the negative emotions. So again, that's why in Buddhism we talk so much about seeing the reality as it is, right? So the way to develop compassion is quite similar to the way you develop bodhicitta. When you see all these mother sentient beings in a very pathetic, difficult situation. And similarly when you see that how many times they have been, they have helped you, how kind they have been in many lives, then you will be able to develop this feeling of closeness to all these sentient beings, all these mother sentient beings. And then you will be able to develop an uncontrived, develop a, a kind of an uncontrived compassion. Un uncontrived means genuine compassion. Genuine compassion. The more you are able to see that kindness, the more you are able to, like take the example of your present mother who has been so kind to you for the last many, 30, 20, 30 years. Now suddenly today she got a very bad disease where she, is, she has kind of lost her mind. Okay, and she is doing all the things that she, she should not be doing and not doing all those things, you know, which should be done. Then if you are a good son and good daughter of that mother, you will take more care of this mother than when she was healthy. That makes perfect sense because when she was healthy, even if you don't take care, it's fine. She will take, take care of herself. Now, this kind mother, because of insanity, she is unable to take care of herself. Therefore, it's my responsibility. Therefore, it is my responsibility to recall the kindness that she has extended to me. And even if she does many bad things to you also, you will not get angry. Because you know the mother doesn't want to hurt you, but because of insanity of the mind, she is hurting you. Similarly, all the bad things the sentient beings are doing to you, not because they enjoy it, but because of insanity of mind. All the killings that is happening into the today in, in different names is because of insanity, negative emotions. When the negative emotions are there, then not only they will harm other people, they will also harm themselves. There are cases of many people committing suicide because of ignorance, because of negative emotions. Right? So it is really like the Buddhist training is very, very realistic. So in, so in order to develop this bodhicitta, so first you should see the sameness of oneself with others. We are all same. We are all same in what sense? We are all same wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. It's not just you who wants suffering, who wants happiness, not suffering. It's all, all sin in me, not only human beings, all sin in beings wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. As I said, sameness in the sense of wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. Now in terms of experiencing of suffering, we don't want even the tiniest bit of suffering. The bite of mosquito, we don't want. It's a, it's a words from the Guru Puja where Benjil Lohsang said that not wanting the tiniest bit of suffering, 
and having no contentment, no sense of satisfaction in, in the well-being or happiness. In this regard, there is not an iota of difference between you and other human beings. Therefore, the way to get that happiness is do something that pleases others. Do something that will make others happy, just as you would do something for yourself. Like for example, look at us. You know, individually we take so much care about oneself, right? We are not good. I'm not saying you are good in taking care of yourself, but at least we take so much care about ourselves, be it your food, be it your clothing, be it, be it <coughs> that's whom you go, be it your study, education, at least you are making a lot of attempt. Right? Right? But one day, out of the blue, somebody comes and says, Young lady, I saw you that you are taking so much care about yourself. You are, you are you know, feeding yourself, you are washing your clothes, you know, you are making your bed, whatever, you know, you are doing so many things for yourself. Why are you taking so much care about yourself? If somebody out of the blue asks you this strange question, what, what, what will be your answer? What will be your answer? Is it a good answer if you say, Oh, I have to take care of myself because I'm a professor? or I'm a scientist, you can give all kinds of stupid answers, but I don't think that is the correct answer. The correct answer is, I take care of myself because I want happiness and do not want suffering. That's the correct answer. In this case, you should also take care of others because they want happiness, do not want suffering. <coughs> then again, your you know, mind, stupid, clever mind will say, or cunning mind will say, yeah, yeah, there's two others want happiness, do not want suffering, but they, they'll take care of themselves. I will take care of myself. Who, who the hell I am to take care of themselves, you know? I have enough problem myself to worry about. How can I take care of... The Buddhist teaching says this is the narrow-minded way of thinking. Therefore, His Holiness says, if you want to be selfish, be wisely selfish. Taking care of others is the wise way of being selfish. Thinking just about yourself and forgetting <coughs> others is the stupid way of being selfish. You see? And in fact, when you say that, okay, others, will, they will take care of themselves, I will take care of myself. When you say this, you, you, don't, you are not seeing the connection between you and others. This is almost like saying that when your leg is hurt, the hand refuses to go down by saying, oh, it's the leg, not the hand. Why should the hand go down to help the leg? <coughs> the hand must go down to help the leg because of this connection. It's the leg that carries the head. So when the leg is in trouble, the head must go down. So the rest of the sentient being, the Buddhist teaching says, the rest of the sentient beings are part of yourself, just, here, just like your legs and hands. And also logically, in your case, however important you are, you're just one person. The rest of are countless, you see. So one man sacrificing, he always gives this very wonderful example by saying that if ten beggars come begging something from you, all these ten beggars, you've never met them in, their, in your life asking for some food. And then you just, you never met them, but they are all beggars, they are all poor. But still if you, you know, look like this and then for one beggar you give one hundred dollars, another beggar, you know, maybe one hundred rupees. Then the third one said, you go, get lost, I don't want to give you anything. If you make such a discrimination, it is stupid, sen senseless, because they are all beggar, they are all poor, you don't know them, you see. So they should all be treated equally. So similarly, all sentient beings, they are kind of beggar in the sense they don't have the needed positive qualifications, qualities, negative emotions and sufferings, they have a lot. So they are all in need. So therefore help all of them, <coughs> mother sentient beings. Right? So therefore, with this, this understanding, see that all sentient beings are exactly like you, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. So that is called seeing oneself equal to others. 
Then next step is exchange, the practice of exchange of oneself to others. Now exchange of oneself to others does not mean that your mind is replaced by other people's mind or your body is replaced by other people's body. That is impossible to do. So in order to meditate on this practice of exchange, the first most important practice is highlighting or understanding the faults of self-cherishing attitude. Ranchinzi, da chinzi, ranchinzi, self-cherishing attitude. Now self-cherishing attitude does not mean, when we talk about the faults of self-cherishing attitude, we are not saying that you don't take care of yourself, you don't cherish yourself. But self-cherishing attitude here means <coughs> thinking just about oneself and completely forgetting the needs of others. There are many people today, unfortunately, who say, oh, I don't care, it's not my business, you know, let them go to hell. Very unfortunate, you see. So therefore, as I said, this self-cherishing attitude is really like a chronic illness, symbolically and also truly. As I said, much of the problems, diseases, physical diseases, mental illnesses, come because of this self-cherishing attitude, thinking just oneself and completely forgetting others. This is one of the, the main mind which imprisons you. And this mind harms you when it joins the company of ignorance. Ignorance is a mind which sees all sentient beings as having objective, intrinsic, independent existence. self cherishing attitude mind thinks just about oneself and completely forget others. So these two, two are like the, the army general of a big terrorist organization trying to destroy the wisdom, understanding, emptiness <coughs> and trying to destroy bodhicitta. The negative counterforce against bodhicitta is self-cherishing attitude. The negative counterforce against wisdom, understanding, emptiness is ignorance, mind which does not see the reality, right? So therefore, last teaching also I emphasized on the same point, this, this time also I am emphasizing on the same point. So, Two things you should know. Of course, there are many things to know. Two, two main things that you should know is what is really important to you and what is also the heart of Buddhist teaching is cultivation of bodhicitta and wisdom, understanding, emptiness. Right? Clear? And the two foremost obstructive negative forces are say it, say it. Self-changing attitude and Ignorance. Self-cherishing attitude is the foremost negative obstructive force that opposes bodhicitta. And ignorance is a mind which opposes wisdom, understanding, emptiness. Right? Make it very clear. Once you know this, you have already caught hold of the heart of Buddhist teaching. All the countless teachings of the Buddha I mean, at the end of the day, boil down to these two important points. The process of cultivation of bodhicitta and process of cultivation of wisdom, understanding, emptiness. So therefore, when we talk about self cherishing attitude, as I've already explained, it's a mind which thinks just about yourself and completely forget others, right? This is clear. This self cherishing attitude. Now, ignorance means... Ignorance means... Misconception of reality. The reality is that everything is <coughs> interconnected. Reality is that everything is interconnected, interrelated, interdependent. But because of ignorance, we tend to see things as having <coughs> huh? independent existence. Inherent existence. For example, if I see something very attractive, beautiful, handsome, then I will not see it only handsome, but I'll see it, wow, wow, 100% beautiful. 
So at that time you are saying this, this object which you fancied is objectively handsome, objectively beautiful, objectively attractive, right? And what is the problem with that? The problem is that number one, it is not realistic. There is nothing that has hundred percent. There is there is nothing that is hundred percent. You know, objectively beautiful or amazing or attractive. And then more importantly, when you misperceive the object in this way, then you completely get obsessed with this object. I must get this object. You get lost into it. By extension, I can give you this very convincing example that today the world is lost into the material object. Right at the beginning of the teaching, I said that the world is running and running for what? Material accumulation. So we are, we are obsessed with the material <coughs> accumulation, thinking that if you have this nice car, if you have this nice house, if you have this nice husband, if you have this nice wife, then I will be happy, you know. Then you chase them. But the story, the outcome of the story is different. You fancy something, okay, very nice husband, nice person, I'll marry him. Nice wife, nice woman, I'll marry her. I'll be then completely happy. So with this kind of attitude, you get married. Get this husband, get this wife. Then after a while, you see, of course, the initial attractiveness that you, you know, designated is not there. Gradually you, you see the truth, then gradually the relation gets sour. In many cases to the extent of getting divorced. But still we don't learn the lesson. And then still we think, okay, this wife didn't work, but next one will work. This husband didn't work, next one will work. So we spend our whole life changing the externals. Changing wife, changing husband, changing car, changing house, thinking that one day they will be. Buddhist teachings are saying, no, 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 no. By changing externals, you will never get the long lasting peace, happiness. It is, it is not rearranging the externals, but it is rearrange, uh, rearranging the internals you will get this happiness and peace. Now, no, you, you should think about this. I'm just saying it, you know, what I learned from Buddhist teachings. You think about it. See for yourself to get a complete sense and conviction about that. Right? So therefore, again, I must emphasize that the Buddhist focus is on the mind, transformation of the mind, rearranging the internals. And this, I feel, is the need of the hour today in the world. External, rearranging the externals is happening. Since time immemorial, since human beings came to the, on this earth 100,000 years back, right? Since the human life came into this earth. We have been doing this. And especially with the coming of the science and technology, you know. We try to rearrange so many things. All these shiny gadgets and cars, they are like flooding the market. Oh, you know, update your latest mobile, update your phone, update your car. We, we kept on updating, you know, now, now even the iPhones, it started from probably one or something, I don't know. But then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, updating. So that, you know, rearranging the external is going on, it's there. But tell me. You are very good in updating these externals. When was the last time when you updated yourself, the internals? Update chicka chema Same person with the same negative emotion, no update at all. The Buddhist teaching is saying, don't worry too much about updating what is outside, you update yourself. Become more compassionate, become more loving, become more, you know, develop more wider perspective. So the, so the teachings are like amazing, really beautiful. And not only beautiful, but this makes sense in today's world. The world needs it. I'm not just saying this to you. I meet so many people, university students, professors, scholars, <coughs> and I'm not a particular great scholar or things like that. But, but I, when I share this, 
people listen with like rapt attention they are able to understand easily that this is true so the truth is there but the important thing is practice and in order to practice you need to repeatedly think about these teachings not only when you attend the session or teaching but when you are on your own spend some time in the morning do some meditation little bit of reflection charge your battery you have to very soon go into the darkness you know before you go to the darkness normally we charge the battery right so we need to do this all the time then your life will be much much happier much much peaceful even if the whole world is in turmoil still you will be able to remain in peace <coughs> not because you have no concern no sense of responsibility you will show your concern but you will show your wisdom there are things that you can do there are things you cannot do as shanti deva says if it is something that you can change don't worry because you can change if it is something you can't change no use worrying because by worrying you can't change it and i am amazed to see that the same kind of teaching is found in the very ancient time in the greek teachings there is a prayer called prayer of serenity prayer of serenity that prayer of serenity says you know give me the wisdom to face those challenges which i which, sorry uh, give me the power to face those challenges which i cannot change and give me the wisdom to 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 change those which i can and give me the wisdom to know the difference between when when i can what 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 is it that i can change what is it that i cannot change so the same prayer is there according to many you know wisdoms of the world but most of us like don't realize these things so we get stuck for small things you know we never like we it's very difficult for for us to come out of suffering because that 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 suffering that you are experiencing experiencing or you have been experiencing for a long time you know it is suffering in many cases sometimes you don't know sometimes you know it is suffering but it's better for you to live there with that suffering which you have some idea which you are familiar then go to this unfamiliar terrain maybe very good but still you are not familiar so you you don't feel like going you see so we stay in the same kind of comfort zone you see so therefore therefore it is really important you know to 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 adopt a little bit open mindedness to embrace the reality because normally it's not easy to change because as i said the root is self grasping everything that you do it may be wrong it may be mistaken but still you think because it is something that related to me it is something that i do therefore it should be good and we are scared of change so it's important to really little bit open up think and then embark on those new courses of life new directions it's very important and i always give this example of smelly socks <laughs> to prove that how much we are addicted to anything that is belong that belongs to oneself i i give the example of smelly socks when it is your smelly socks it may be old and torn out and smelly still because it's your sock sometimes you bring it to the nose <coughs> is it is it smelling or not smelling don't you do it somebody please be honest huh? <laughs> but when it is somebody else's socks it may be brand new but oh it's in socks you know <laughs> this is the example you know how much we have this addiction to oneself you see so try to get it a little bit of this holding craving grasping open up and have the courage to take the new line of thinking line of practice so i stop here today some questions some questions it's important to interact whatever question i'm not saying i have all the answers but but we can discuss you know we can explore
it is important that Buddhism makes sense in today's world. So in order to help Buddhism make sense in today's world, we need to discuss. Don't just accept it because it is your tradition, especially for the Buddhists. You know, it's not, not good to say this is my tradition, so therefore with, you know, closed eye, I should just embrace it. This will not help you. Right? So don't hang on to the smelly socks, right?